Okay, good afternoon everyone, and welcome to the Frankenstein panel, uh, where we will explore the interplay between Mary Shelley's Frankenstein with real science and technology. We will delve into weird biology, the synthesis of human beings with technology, artificial intelligence, and the related ethical considerations. We just might discuss cases in which science is stranger than science fiction. And so I would like to introduce our fantastic lineup of panelists. We have Professor Jeremy Sito in the Biological Sciences Department. We have Professor Heidi Grover in Entertainment Technology. We have Professor Ashwin Satyana Rayana in Computer Systems Technology. And we have Professor Robert McDougall in the Social Sciences. Yeah. And we have a very enthusiastic audience. <laughs> so let's get started right away. I thought just to um, paint a bit of the background, I'd uh, like to ask each of the panelists to say a few words about your work. Perhaps we can begin with Professor Sita. <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, I am uh, traditionally trained as a neuroscientist, mostly on the molecular level, uh, but these days I do a lot of work on this invisible other organ that we have called the microbiome. Uh, so if you scrape off all these other cells that are inside and outside of your body, uh, it amasses to something on the order of three pounds worth of cells, uh, which is about the equivalent of the human brain. And I've actually uh, gone on to look at the interplay between uh, these organisms, these microorganisms that are living inside you, and how they're actually affecting uh, your, your behavior. Hello. Um, I guess I should have invited people from my department. <laughs> I feel underrepresented. Um, so I uh, work at the intersection of art, uh, science, technology, and social change. For the past 15 years, I've made like video games about immigration, augmented reality apps about homelessness, uh, Facebook games about different types of human rights abuses and things. Um, but for, I guess, more recently, my work has pivoted because I became kind of concerned about the effects of the technology I was using to affect social change and the areas of the brain that it could be potentially uh, eroding. So um, more recently, I've been working on a couple of things. I've been building an open source um, biometric lab, an AI system to isolate the common variables that move us to act. So I'm basically trying to understand the narrative ingredients across different types of media. Um, and I'm also uh, working more uh, deeply in uh, large-scale network dance and performance using biocreative instruments that I develop myself, which read your autonomic and somatic nervous system. So to me, both of those things are connected by understanding uh, the body's intelligence and the role that it plays in social change processes. Hello, everyone. My name is Ashwin. Um, I work on machine learning and data mining problems. Um, more specifically, I look at understanding the human brain, using technology to understand the human brain. One of the biggest challenges in the 21st century has been to understand the human brain. We know very little how our brain works. So that's something that I'm looking at right now. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Rob McDougall, and I teach philosophy here at City Tech. Um, my research is in bioethics, mostly, um, and I'm especially interested in applying political philosophy to bioethics. So I look at a lot of traditional bioethics issues that are more or less health policy or health law issues, and instead of trying to assess the morality of the actions that are being governed or regulated, I look at the questions like the authority of the state to regulate those um, behaviors. So an example might be with uh, organ sales, a lot of the bioethics literature takes the perspective of we want to find out, if, if we want to know what the morality of organ sales is, whether we should allow people to sell their organs, we should look at whether that's moral or immoral. And my uh, perspective is that actually that's not the most important question. The most important question is about the role of the state and what kinds of things the state has the authority to regulate. Hey, thank you all very much. Now we know a bit about our panelists. Let's proceed to the questions. Uh, the first one is for Professor Sita. Uh, Mary Shelley provided practically no detail as to how Frankenstein made his creation come alive. 
though she cites Luigi Galvani's experiments on using electricity to make a dead frog's legs twitch as an influence. We now use electricity to bring back people who have recently died through CPR. Through cryogenics or other means, how far do you imagine we could push the boundary of bringing dead people back to life? Yeah, so it's a very interesting question, and I purposely uh, pulled out some um, images from uh, Galdani's work, uh, which I forget what the um, translation is, uh, something about um, electrical stimulation of motor uh, muscles. And um, you can see there's some snippet from um, Shelley that actually talks about, uh, that uses the words electricity and galvanism. Um, as we know that you can actually take someone who's clinically dead and bring them back to life, uh, usually by resuscitating their heart uh, with electricity. But when we talk about how this was done and how these observations were made, uh, some of it was very fortuitous, right? Uh, prior to this, uh, we had like in the mid 1700s, uh, Benjamin Franklin actually performing experiments using static electricity on, on par paralysis patients uh, with some transient effects. And then uh, Galvani himself was actually not really doing an experiment but when he discovered this, but apparently the, the tale goes that there was an electrical storm and as he was touching uh, uh, like forceps to the, the muscle of dead frog legs that they would start to twitch. And he came up with this idea of what we call galvanism now. Um, and so what, how, do, how do we get to the point where we can bring back people from the dead is a very interesting question because uh, we still don't know exactly uh, what it means to be entirely brain dead, right, and how to bring that type of consciousness back. Uh, we can actually go and manipulate people uh, through their muscles. Um, in fact, um, you know, we have this new major that's coming up uh, in biomedical engineering, and one of the things that I was uh, telling some of those uh, professors is there's this great um, system called, um, what is it, Back Backyard Brains. And they actually sell little kits where you uh, can actually measure electrical responses in your muscle and you know, control claws and stuff like that approximates cybernetics uh, you know, for uh, a classroom environment. So we can, we can do those things. We can actually um, you know, have people manipulate things and use these types of electrical responses in our body. But uh, at the end of the day, I think a lot of what we're interested in, in, in more of a humanities aspect is what it means to be alive as a person you know, having the same type of intellect and experiences. Um, bringing back tissue to life is different than bringing back an entire person. And I think that's where uh, we're kind of stuck at this moment. Thank you, Professor Sita. Uh, yeah. Uh, was let me show the last one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just want to show that this is a reproduction of uh, the actual experiment. So you can just see uh, the frog legs on that table over there. Uh, and so you can see, uh, I guess all the way to the far right would be a Leiden jar, maybe, would you think? That thing, yeah. So that was like, uh, prior to uh, Volta's battery, they can actually store static electricity in such a way to actually manipulate these. So I thought that would be interesting for you guys to look at. Thank you. Uh, Professor Robert, uh, today the, sorry, the uh, today, the human body has been integrated with biophysical technology, including prosthetics that directly read brain commands through electrodes placed in the skull. If Frankenstein had lived in today's world, how might he have made use of biophysical technology? Okay. Um, I guess when I first read that question, I was thinking to myself that I felt a little bit like Frankenstein. <laughs> Uh, in that, um, so I might go a little bit deeper and talk about the, the limbic lab that I'm building um, because it takes in many different biophysical signals. Uh, in addition, it takes in EEG and what we call FNIR, so it's both spatial and temporal data, um, as well as biophysical, so it's taking in muscle contraction, heartbeat, blood flow, um, as well as I have spatial information as well, but that's not necessarily biophysical in a sense, um, and then I'm also taking in um, facial recognition and eye tracking. So what's happening in this lab basically is as somebody is viewing certain types of content, whether it's a video game or it's a episodic television program, I am capturing um, all of this data real time at specific event locked moments. And those particular event locked moments are determined as salient in that particular narrative arc. 
Um, and the reason I do that is because if I just captured all of this data real time, it would be meaningless, right? Because that would be a lot of unnecessary data. So I'm trying to basically sort of isolate and target certain moments within these narrative structures, scene by scene, that are most effective. And so once I event lock and I capture that data, it's being patched into a database of signatures. Um, and then from there, what I can do with the database material is then feed it into a predictive modeling script to determine which variables are more salient within which medium, and then even connect that back to survey analysis with looking at ideological preferences, viewing patterns, demographic data, and that sort of stuff. Um, but the real thing that I'm trying to figure out right now, which might sound Frankensteinian, is um, how do I then take those variables that I've determined within the predictive modeling script and patch it into a machine learning algorithm to automate media production processes. Because then what we can do is actually target right, uh, individuals as opposed to mass audiences to sort of understand basically their bioadaptive responses, their unconscious responses real time as they're viewing content and change it on the fly. Um, so I think Frankenstein, I mean that's one area just in media but I do think some other areas to look at would be sensory substitution and really sort of understanding that we've moved from um, externally moving people and sort of controlling hearts and minds in a sense to sort of internal looking at internal processes that are not unconscious, are, that are unconscious but also invisible. Thank you. You should definitely collaborate because I do the same things that you do. <laughs> That's why you two are sitting next to each other. Uh, Professor Satyana Riana. Unlike Frankenstein, who simply created his monster because he could, we consider the applications as well as unintended consequences of new technology, such as artificial intelligence. Who should take responsibility, developers or end users, for the unintended consequences of AI? Will AI take jobs away from people, i.e. does automation lead to unemployment? Should we consider how we are applying AI? What is the impact on people and on the environment? So, if you could please start the, yeah. So, as the question goes, um, Frankenstein simply created the monster because he could. So that's what he did, he just created the monster because he could. But now, what we are doing is we are also creating monsters in terms of gadgets, if you just could, yeah. So we are also creating all these gadgets which are lurking in our pockets, and they're actually weapons of mass distraction not mass destruction, but mass distraction. They're causing a lot of distraction, especially students. So now we're creating all these things. And in most companies, what we see is, when we're creating some new technology, there are three questions asked. Is it faster? Is it cheaper? Is it more convenient? If you can So is it faster? Is it better? Is it cheaper? These are three things that keep coming up. But rarely do we ask this question with one more unintended consequences, do we actually think about this in the design? Most often we don't think about these things. And are we thinking about the impact that the technology could have on, on people and on the environment? Yeah, on people and the environment. Are we thinking about the long-term effects that cell phones could have on people? So right now, somehow the design does not incorporate the ethical implications so, if you go to the next slide. Um, so, weapons of mass distraction, these are all these apps, and the attention span of students is reducing because of this. And coming back to Frankenstein, if you click one more, so he actually felt lonely, the, cre the, the creature that he created, he actually felt so lonely that he went and killed the creator. And if you think about it, because of these um, distractions that we have, we are also feeling lonely, one, yeah. We are also feeling very lonely. We may have 500 friends on Facebook, but we're actually very lonely. So in many, in many ways, we are creating these gadgets, these weapons which are distracting us, not helping us focus. And there's one more question asked about, will AI take jobs away? The next slide. So will AI take jobs, our jobs away? So the answer is no, because it's just going to be so what happened was when Mary Shelley was, uh, was writing this book, exactly during that time, the textile industry lost a lot of jobs because of the textile industry. 
So, and there was a huge revolution at that time where people were thinking that they're going to lose all their jobs, but actually they did not lose jobs. It's just that they had a shift in the types of jobs. So if you click, so it's just going going from one type of job to another. Uh, one more. So from old job to new job. So we will all have our jobs. It's not that all our jobs are going to go away. So just stop here. Thank you, Professor McDougall. Today, Frankenstein would have needed to submit an IRB proposal and demonstrate he would provide his creation with information about his study and allow it to choose whether or not to participate further. Instead, he had a simpler method for dealing with ethical considerations. Every time his creation killed someone, he would fall feverishly ill. When the monster begged him to make a companion because he felt all alone in the world, what would have been some of the ethical considerations involved in determining the best course of action? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, so so the, um, the number of things might, you might think about, you might think first about autonomy, right? Like, would this creature that uh, Dr. Frankenstein is bringing into uh, being, being uh, would that creature choose to be brought into being in this way? But, actually, I don't think that that's that important a consideration because none of us really choose how we get brought into the world, right? We don't get to choose the parents that we're born to, the, the socioeconomic status that we have. We don't choose what we look like, what race we are, anything like that. Um, so the autonomy point might not be uh, the most helpful lens to look at it through. Um, you might also think about whether it would do harm to this creature to bring it into being. So I think Frankenstein, some of his, uh, sorry, the monster, I always get confused. It's Frankenstein's a monster, right? Frankenstein's a doctor. Uh, the, the monster um, feels bad for a lot of different reasons. He, feels may, he may even feel like it, you know, it was, he's been harmed by being brought into existence in the way that he has. Um, there, this, this is a, there's a famous problem in philosophy called the non-identity problem which actually says that it's impossible for us to talk about risks and benefits to non-existent persons. And the reason for that is that you, you can't actually do anything to change the risks and benefits for non-existent persons because as soon as you start acting in certain ways to, to like change the, the uh, proportion of benefits and risks that those future persons will experience, you're actually altering the identity of the persons that will be born. Uh, the reason for that is because uh, it, we're probably all somewhat familiar with the specifics of human reproduction. Uh, even just changing the, the moment of conception slightly will actually change the identity of the being who's born as a result. So if you start um, uh, you know, trying to manipulate uh, uh, the, the circumstances under which somebody's born to make their life a better one, what you succeeded in doing not, is not making that person's life better, but actually bring a different person into existence who may have a better life than the other person you were thinking of, but it's a different person. So you couldn't actually harm uh, this being by bringing it into existence because the only alternative would be non-existence, which would, would be no better. Um, so that's a non-identity problem. Uh, neither of these things would be really that relevant to thinking about whether we should bring the companion into the world. I think what might be more relevant is you might want to think about the motivations for doing so, what kind of a person uh, would, would bring uh, these monsters into the world. Um, you, or maybe it would be a good person that would be solving a problem for the monster. Um, you might also think um, about unintended consequences. Like you were saying, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Frankenstein really didn't do a very good job of predicting the consequences of his actions the first time. He might think, well, I'm going to create a, a second monster to make up for the problems with the first monster that I made, but it could be twice the destruction that he ends up making, right? Because he wasn't a very good predictor the first time. Um, and then you might also think about the, the will of this creature that he's bringing into existence. So I don't think it's wrong to bring something into existence for certain ends. For example, you might have kids because you, you want to have a certain kind of life. I don't think that that's wrong. That's a pretty normal thing for people to do. It wouldn't be wrong for him to bring a companion in for the monster so that he would have a companion. But once that being is there, you have to respect it to a certain extent and say, well, what if this being doesn't want to be a partner to the monster? And that would be something we have to be careful of, right? You wouldn't want to assume that the outcome of this is going to be a happy companion for the monster. So. Thank you. Coming back to Professor Sito. Frankenstein created a living monster out of various human body parts. What are some ways in which the idea of putting things together to create life done in biology? <clears throat> so, 
Uh, these days, it's a very exciting time in biology uh, because what we're talking about in terms of creating a life out of multiple parts, we think of like in a macroscopic level. Uh, and we can always think about prostheses and other types of augmentations that people do, uh, which some of us wouldn't call them augmentations because they're weird. Uh, but the thing is, uh, on a molecular level, you can see in the news these days uh, things about uh, CRISPR-Cas9 system. Uh, like just as yesterday, there was this uh, thing in the news about uh, the designer baby and how we're uh, capable of manipulating genomes now to you know, add or subtract uh, you know, molecular parts. Uh, this is a very interesting thing because uh, when we look at it, once again, on the microscopic level, not on the macroscopic level, uh, we have to understand the very basics of how life is defined from a biologist's perspective, which is you know, the ability to reproduce and uh, you know, seek out uh, the necessary resources and adapt to the environment, and also uh, to transfer uh, the information or the program to another generation. Uh, so these days, uh, we have the onset of a synthetic biology, Biologists have already uh, been able to recreate uh, artificial cells uh, with artificial chromosomes uh, that seek out to see what, what is absolutely what we used to call junk DNA. Uh, if we remove all of it, what happens to the organism? Um, and we've been able to see uh, if that is really uh, going to be useful. Um, over the course of time, once again, when we talk about uh, unintended consequences, uh, what we used to call junk DNA when I was in graduate school is now found to be very useful for other reasons, right? So um, we're always learning about how uh, we can take parts and rebuild circuitry, um, which is what synthetic biology is. Uh, but we can also think about um, how we're, like speaking of the CRISPR uh, news from yesterday, the designer baby, it was supposed to be simply to remove the ability for um, HIV reservoirs to exist inside the body you know, to, to remove that. But at the same time, uh, it's removing a receptor that is ultimately somewhat important for the immune response in general. So once again, what are the long-term um, responses uh, for, you know, carrying out uh, the genetic programs? Uh, this is also related to how we treat ecosystems, right? Um, some of you might have heard of gene drives, uh, such as if we're, if we're trying to deal with uh, vector-borne illnesses from mosquitoes, if you do something to the mosquito population that propagates something that will ultimately make them fail uh, to reproduce in the long run, uh, what unintended consequences would we have? Because at the end of the day, like I always say, uh, when I talk about being a, uh, studying microbiomes, this is an organ that is not made up of us, but is integral to what we are. And if we look at ecosystems in general, they are living organisms uh, as well. They just don't simply have the consciousness that we, we like to think about in terms of an organism. So gene drives are, could be potentially dangerous, but beneficial, and there are always long-lasting um, problems with that, right? We, all, we, we also have seen uh, prior to that, um, in the early 70s, uh, when recombinant DNA was um, becoming abundant, and biologists were taking um, little bits, bits of DNA from bacteria and constructing them, putting them back together. And it got to the point where they were ultimately almost going to create a completely antibiotic-resistant bacterium. And then they stopped, and there was a moratorium because they, they realized that this would be a potential problem. Now we have that potential problem, like in reality, because we have uh, multidrug-resistant bacteria that just evolved because of our overusage of of uh, these, these compounds. But uh, we always have to be wary about uh, how far we take things um, in, in the context of using parts and because we don't necessarily see uh, you know, the holistic picture at the end uh, sometimes. Thank you. Professor Braver. Frankenstein created life out of various human body parts, but he neglected to consider the psychological aspects of his creation. What are some of the potential psychological effects, positive or negative, and neurobiological impacts of linking the human body with technology? Okay. Um, so I guess I would like to pick up a little bit on what you were talking about earlier, because I actually see you know, what I would call intelligent technology, mobile devices, uh, web, websites, immersive displays like VR and AR as it becomes increasingly mainstream. Um, 
as technology, they may be technologically outside the body, but they're also prosthetics, right, to some degree, and our dependence upon them has actually um, affected or eroded two key areas in the brain, the amygdala and the hippocampus. We now know, you know, through many, many, many clinical studies, um, and my own research also looked at the way in which these intelligent technologies are essentially a slow form of violence that's rescripting our nervous systems. Um, but that particular area in the brain, right, the amygdala and the hippocampus, is responsible for memory consolidation. And that critical function um, is important for a number of things, one of which is knowledge schema production, how we make meaning in the world, um, our emotion regulation and activation. So in essence, it's, also, it's responsible for decision making, it's responsible for empathy, you know, cultivating a sense of empathy. And these particular regions, as we become increasingly dependent upon these devices and they erode, they're actually literally changing the structure of our brains, right? In terms of the gray area, the gray matter. Um, so I guess my concern is, is that as these technologies begin to shrink and move from our hands into our bodies, um, we're not really taking into account these long-term um, physiological responses or patterns that are going to evolve from our consumption habits. Um, so I guess the, one of the reasons why I've been I moved away from making media to measuring media is because I actually see that they're collapsing right now. And if I can actually measure and sort of understand how media and technology are affecting us, um, then can we change the trajectory of technology and design more ethically as these technologies begin to enter our bodies? Thank you. Professor Satyana Ariana, the Facebook engineer Justin Rosenstein, who created the like button, refers to it as bright dings <coughs> of pseudo pleasure and has banned himself from Snapchat, imposes limits on his Facebook use and has parental controls installed on his phone to pre prevent him from downloading apps. In a world full of data, is humanity being absorbed into a sort of Frankensteinian monster <coughs> composed of iPhones, email, smartwatches, with everyone in a state of continuous partial attention? If so, then how do we counteract this, particularly as educators? Mm -hmm. I just want to talk about the continuous partial attention the problem that we're all facing right now. If you can go to the next slide. So it has been shown that uh, the attention span has reduced from 12 seconds to 8 seconds in just 10 years, because mostly because of these gadgets that are coming up. And, uh, next. Yeah. and so even in the classroom, we find that the level of performance goes down once you start reaching the 60-minute mark. So students have a very small attention span of about, of about four to 10 minutes. And after that, it just keeps going down. And one of the main reasons for this is the technology, because we're training ourselves with these gadgets to keep shifting from one thing to another, from one app to another. You know? uh, so it becomes very difficult to focus on one thing for a very long time. Um, as, as far as uh, technology is concerned, if you're thinking that AI is going to take over the world in the next five years, it's not going to happen anytime soon. And there is this famous paradox, if you go to the next slide, there's this famous paradox called, uh, actually one more slide. There's this famous paradox called the, the Moravex paradox. What this says is, um, it says that even though computers today exhibit adult level performance in terms of winning the Jeopardy contest, for example, so IBM Watson actually won the Jeopardy contest. And in terms of chess, computers today can outperform any player, the best human player in terms of chess. But the paradox is that when you compare these intelligent computers with a one-year-old kid, when it comes to perception and mobility, there's no match at all in terms of where we are right now. So it's going to take us many more years before robots can actually start teaching, start becoming software engineers, and so on. So we don't have to worry about it in the near future. So if you, uh, so this is the Jeopardy uh, the contest where IBM Watson won first prize. And here, this is Kasparov losing against the computer. But when you look at a small child, one-year-old child, there's no robot that can match this right now. So if you go back. The previous slide. 
So in terms of educators, so what can we do to help our students understand? Um, so it's time to for a digital detox. How many of you have heard of this digital detox? Um, it's staying away from, from technology for some time. And then people have actually tried this for a week, completely away from technology. And they found immense benefits. So that's one thing. And then we need to talk about the ethical implications of technology, the good and bad side of technology to our students, because they're going to be the future designers. So we have to talk to them, not just about the good side of technology, but there are some ethical implications of technology, which we should address as part of um, the design. And uh, the responsibility is not just on the developers, but it's also on the end users. So once a technology is created, it's up to us as end users on how we're going to use it. Like for example, this uh, the Facebook engineer, he uh, banned himself from, from using, from downloading more apps and so on. So that's, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Professor McDougall. Frankensteinian experiments of recent years include cloning Dolly the sheep, transplanting animal organs into humans, and growing tomatoes endowed with genes from fish to make them freeze tolerant. Unlike Frankenstein, who didn't consider how his work might go wrong, editing and rewriting genomes could cause unintended harm and contaminate the world. What types of regulatory structure should be in place? Um, OK, thank you. So I don't know if people heard, but uh, yesterday there was a news release that the first uh, human baby with an edited genome has been born. Actually, it was twins, I think. And what they did is they edited out the, a gene that they think makes people susceptible to HIV. One of the parents had HIV. Um, they don't know if this is true or not. It's a, a Chinese researcher who hasn't been able to, hasn't provided any proof yet. Uh, but these are you know, pressing issues right now, especially because they did it right one day before the, uh, the, the, the international symposium on the ethics of editing the human genome. Uh, some people think to upstage it. So, um, how, do you, how do you regulate this? What are the best regulatory? Well, we have mechanisms in place that help us to sort of deal with specific and discrete harms to individual persons. So this is, when, when something like that happens, usually we go through civil law, right? You would sue somebody if somebody harms you in a discrete and clear way. So like for Frankenstein's monster, Frankenstein is running around killing people. Or sorry, Frankenstein's monster is running around. I'm probably going to do that every time I talk. Um, killing people, and uh, you know, the, the Frank, Frankenstein could be held uh, liable, and, uh, criminally liable, or civilly liable for the consequences of his creation, right? And that's something that we already have well worked out in, in terms of our law. Um, where it gets a little bit more tricky is with some of the newer scientific issues, where we, so so when you hold somebody civilly liable. Usually you have to, it relies on a jury making the judgment that that person has violated some kind of duty that they had, um, a duty of care. And with some of the more complicated scientific developments, um, it's very difficult for lay people to make um, any kind of reasonable uh, decision or judgment about whether those companies have violated a duty that they would have otherwise had. Um, in part because there's a huge discrepancy of like scientific knowledge between the corporations or the scientists that made these things and then the average lay people. Um, also because our community just hasn't really developed a set of uh, mores and like uh, ethical position on exactly who's responsible, for example, when a, something like a computer does something that's terrible. We don't have like good responses to that that have developed. So people don't have strong intuitions or intuitions about that stuff. So uh, instead of holding people liable through the civil law, uh, another strategy is to get a bunch of academics together, um, have a big uh, uh, like a commission, like a presidential commission. That's something we do in the US or in the EU. They have an equivalent where they get a bunch of smart academics, philosophers, and scientists together and come up with a set of rules governing these new technologies, the idea being that those will keep us safe. And uh, the, the idea is that they can do a, a better job than sort of lay people would do. Um, but those get criticized too, because in, in part because almost always the, it's an administration that would appoint those commissions, and so they're always politically tinged, no matter what. They always no administration is going to appoint a group that's going to disagree with its main policies and ethical and legal views, right? Um, and so it's not a quick or easy solution either to the problem of uh, how to regulate these new technologies. Thank you. Now back to Professor Sito. 
Frankenstein seemed to have a rather simplistic view of scientific knowledge. After a short time at university, he felt that he knew everything there was to know about the human body. Do you think it is ever possible for biologists to learn everything about the human body? Is there an end to human biology? <laughs> so when we look at uh, Frankenstein, we all, we all know that part of the message was about hubris of, of, of man. Uh, and actually when we talk about someone thinking that they know every, everything, that's kind of uh, anathema to the idea of what an academic or a scientist actually is, where we're always trying to revise and extend our base of knowledge. On top of that, with respect to what we're learning about uh, our genome uh, as it is now, uh, some like 18 years after the first draft of our genome came out, is um, that there's a lot of redundancy in what we have. And because of that redundancy of our genes, we've actually had uh, evolved new functions for some of these uh, genes and gene products. Uh, so there's always something more to learn, uh, especially when we haven't come to a point uh, where we've actually had to face various challenges that would be selective towards um, you know, these, uh, these things that we've never seen within our body before. You know, when we look at things, uh, we always use the example of like uh, the sickle cell trait, right? Why is it still around if it's so uh, detrimental? Because we, we realize that there is some benefit to a certain population exposed to a certain type of disease, right? Um, and it's only in that context where you would see the propagation of this uh, deleterious type of trait. So a lot of times when we look at the parts that we have, we haven't really learned about um, everything and every single context in which um, you know, our gene products and our body parts can actually adapt. Uh, to the environment around us, and uh, also uh, what we don't have uh, taken into account in this question is also uh, the fact that there are these sort of uh, horizontal transfers of, of genes from other organisms over um, you know our historical time, where we've gained things from external places. So that's another thing that we always have to be wary of, uh, whether through infection or other or design in this case. Thank you. Professor Braver, could you discuss how the legacy of cybernetics shapes current technological development and where the sixth wave of innovation focused on biological mitigation might be taking us? Does someone answer my own question? <laughs> um, we might need to define cybernetics first, I suppose. Um, so cybernetics uh, emerged out of World War II and I actually see it as kind of like a teleological forking moment of disembodiment. Um, so what you start to see post-World War II is there's a number of different institutions that started to emerge around the same time. So there's cybernetics, which emerged at the Macy conferences, which was a bunch of white dudes, and Margaret Mead, the anthropologist, who some might argue was had some masculine characteristics. Um, and they were kind of a group that came together um, to, to kind of understand if they could kind of dig into complex science and biofeedback and really build a simulation of the brain and, and the body, right, through computers, or what they're calling computers at the time. But really what they're doing is building kind of like a propaganda machine for the information age. Um, and they were, it was based around a couple of different ethics, right? They're really focusing on social control, quantification and prediction, all sorts of things we're starting to see today emerge out of big data um, and other forms of uh, technological devices that we're using that we may not be conscious are actually tracking us and controlling us in different ways. Um, so, but cybernetics emerged uh, around, you know, post-World War II, I said, you know, around the 1950s. Uh, the conferences took place, you know, every 10 years or so, and there were three different waves. But you can map these waves also to these uh, waves of technological innovation, right? So Schumpeter, who is an economist, came up with this theory around um, technological innovation that maps different waves from the 1880s forward, moving from the steam engine to now. But then um, Daniel Smahula came in recently, he's a Czech economist, and defined a sixth wave, and that sixth wave specifically focuses on biological mitigation. So if you look kind of historically back from the three waves of cybernetics and then these kind of waves of innovation, what you see is a movement um, away from controlling people 
through movement externally, right, say the steam engine, to internal, what I would call colonization, right? Being able to control and calculate how people are gonna act and behave from the inside out. Um, so kind of tying that together, I guess one of the things that I start to see around 1950s is that not only was cybernetics emerging, but also um, we see the DSM emerged at the same time, right? So we start regulating emotions. Um, and then the other thing that emerged around this time is Madison Avenue, right? So we start seeing advertisements and different types of ways of controlling people through advertisements and selling new things and consumerism emerges. Um, and then the last thing um, that emerged at this time was the NGO industrial complex, right? So we start seeing a lot of bodies uh, emerging, looking at different types of social issues. Um, but the way in which we were looking at these issues was as broken systems. So I started to see these trends emerging between um, not only rejecting the body, the, the physical, our affect and our senses, but also regulating our emotions and then canalizing our senses in some way. So like high fidelity sound and these things come out, which was also something that was perpetuated through Madison Avenue. Um, so what I see now is that we've moved away from these kind of external forms of having us, our bodies and our minds, taking over our cognitive and our affective faculties, essentially. And something that's become more surreptitious and quietly taking over things like our autonomic and somatic nervous systems. Um, so again, I guess that's why I'm interested in looking at the body's intelligence, not just simply the mind, because I think we need to consider those two things together as these technologies start going into our bodies. Thank you. Professor Satyana Rayana, what do you envision for the deep future of big data and how do we deal with it? Would there eventually be more big data based on the behavior of a huge population of AI? In this era of big data, can we use data analytics to see where we are heading? For instance, Google self-driving cars generate nearly one gig per second i.e. two petabytes of data per car per year, which is being used to predict unusual events in real time. Can we use data analytics to predict some of the future consequences of technology? So just last week, Google came up with this famous slogan saying that if you Google how long you will live, Google will come up with an answer in the, in the near future. So they're using data to predict all kinds of things. The next slide, just one second. So, uh, that's next. Oh, next. next slide. Next slide. Yeah, right here. So, so the rise of big data, one of the main reasons of the rise of big data is technology. If you put one. So, the data evolution and the rise of big data is mainly because of all the gadgets that we are creating, whether it's phones, YouTube, there's tons of data that's, that's happening, uh, that's coming in. We are uh, using exabytes and petabytes of data these days. Um, so, now how are we using all this data? So data is only useful if you can gather good intelligence from it. That's the whole key. If you cannot gather good intelligence from data, then data is pointless. So what is being done right now is they're using data to make these predictions. So you can predict student grades, for example. I have a tool that I use in my class um, by which I can predict the grades of students in the first day of their class, as soon as they take the the first class, I give them a survey, and then I can actually, the tool actually predicts their grade with 95% accuracy. So there are tools which predict cancer cells, and there's so many prediction tools available. So now, how do we use these tools to determine the unintended consequences of AI? It turns out that, if you just click one more. So right now, this data analytics is treated as a black box, where data comes in, and you can some useful decisions come out. So why can't we use the same strategy to predict unintended consequences of AI, of the technology? So, so why can't we predict human behavior? This is something that's being looked at. Um, so given a new technology, you plug that technology into this black box, and that black box will tell you what the human behavior is going to be. How will humans react to this technology 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line, and so on. And that will help us prepare this technology better for the future. So, thank you. Thank you. Professor McDougall, we attempt to simulate life through artificial intelligence. 
if machines can ever be considered as entities that can perceive, feel, act, then how should we consider their moral and legal status? Will we consider the suffering of feeling machines? And will they have the same rights as human beings? Would all humans and feeling machines be created equal? Uh, this, this is a really good question. So, um, usually when we think of adults, we think of uh, adults have full moral and legal status. And what it means to have moral status is just um, that you're a being who can be held praiseworthy or blameworthy. So in other words, when you do something, we either think that you did, we can, it makes sense to say that you did that and that we can evaluate whether it was a good or bad thing to do. In contrast to like a dog or something like that where, you know, a dog does something bad and we say, oh, bad dog, but we don't really think the dog is like bad morally. We think it's, uh, it's the product of its sort of its, its training. It's been reinforced many times, right? If you ever heard the, the saying that there's no such thing as a bad dog, there's only bad owners, uh, that's reinforcing this idea that dogs don't really have moral status. So the question about the question that people have asked about artificial intelligence is, well, you know, if we created a being that was like a computer or a robot that had the same kind of abilities that we have as adult as adults, uh, would it have moral and legal status just like? just like we do. Um, and the way that a lot of people have answered this question is they've looked to specific, what you might call necessary conditions for uh, moral and legal status. So they say, well, two things that we know for sure that you need to have to have full moral status is you need to have the ability to be intentional. So to intend to do things, do things on purpose. And then the ability to foresee the consequences of your actions. Those are the two main things that make somebody have moral status. And so, you know, for example, like if, if somebody's criminally insane, if they're not able to predict the consequences of their actions, then we don't hold them liable to the same extent we would somebody with full moral or legal status. So they say, as long as a robot had those two things, maybe we should treat it as something with full moral status. Um, I tend to disagree. I don't know that it falls that quickly. I think those are probably necessary conditions, but I don't know that they're sufficient conditions. Um, there are more things at stake in moral status than just uh, intentionality and the ability to foresee things. So uh, w one thing you might think about is a responsibility question. So if we said that uh, robots or machines could have full moral responsibility, usually what that means is that at that point, once they're granted that moral responsibility, the person who created them is no longer on the hook for whatever it is they do. So this would be important, for example, in the Frankenstein uh, story, right? Who is responsible for what Frankenstein does? Is it, uh, sorry, the monster, is it, is it Frankenstein, the doctor, or is it the monster who's killing people? Um, and, and my thought is that it's not clear at all to me that the monster is the one to blame for what he's doing. Uh, it makes a lot of sense, I think, to hold Frankenstein responsible for what the monster does, in part because uh, we, we want people to think about the consequences of what it is that they're creating. And so it makes sense for us not to, not to hold the, the monster or the robot responsible to say that the responsibility is still either on the people that create it being or on the, the person who, who comes to own it, if, 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 if that happens. Um, a second way you might think about it is there's also a recognition problem. So um, normally, like when I'm looking out at all of you, you look like human beings. And I assume that you're all beings endowed with full moral status. So I can't come up to you and touch you without your permission, for example, or take something that you have without your permission, right? I, I haven't done any tests on you to see if you have the ability to intend things, or to foresee things. I just assume because you look human that you have these abilities, right? Now, if inanimate, uh, if robots could be, have intentionality and foreseeability, that adds a whole level of complexity, right? Because, like for example, a woman in the front row has a computer, right? And if I don't know whether that computer has the ability to foresee or intend actions, I don't know whether I need to ask the computer's permission to touch it or whether I can just pick it up and start using it. So moral status has a practical uh, role that it plays in our society that, that can't just be reduced to the capacities uh, that human beings have. Thank you. I think we have a couple of minutes left for some questions from the audience. Please. I've got, I would much rather have this be a conversation than uh, watching you guys hit softballs. But um, <laughs> I, I've got to say, in order to move toward that conversation, um, I've got like a thousand comments. Let me make two. One, Victor Frankenstein is not to be trusted. I think Mary Shelley makes that clear. When the monster, 
who is called the monster by Victor, um, asks him, asks Victor to make him a bride, he agrees. But then, according to Victor, um, he realizes that, and I'm paraphrasing Victor, this creature is superior to me. He is stronger. He can withstand more extremes of the weather. He can live on bark. He is, it's noted, a vegetarian. So, in fact, the creature does not commit a single act against a human being until, I'm talking about the book, not the movie, he does not commit a single act against a human being until he sees Victor stop halfway through creating a bride for him, and Victor's justification is, not that I trust him, they would displace us. In other words, what I've been listening to is, well, what happens when something bad gets out of the lab? But in fact, Mary Shelley's novel has Victor ask, what happens when something good gets out of the lab? And I think that if we want to read that novel, at least, clearly, and understand the ethical and political questions and gender questions and so on behind it, we need to understand the details of the dynamics among the characters. And I could go on at great length about that, and have, on the record. Which brings me to saying that although you, sir, um, I don't want to mess up your last name, so forgive me using your first, Ashwin, um, are very confident that AI will not take away our jobs. I would like to answer, as every financial advisor in the country would, past experience is no predictor of future performance. You seem to be concerned with, and in using more of X law, with the inability today to have a robot that can do exactly what a one-year-old human being can do. I'm not worried about that. I use a toaster oven rather than my whole oven when I want to make something little. Industrial robots do not have to learn how to do the tango. You put together a dozen single-purpose machines, and they completely wipe out the jobs of individuals. I'm maybe the oldest person here, um, which is, God, I can't remember when I joined the faculty at 24. I said, but now I'm, I was a young Turk, now I'm an old fart. Anyway, I remember when we had secretaries. They typed over our manuscripts. They would go to the library and pick up books for us. All of those people are gone. The expectation is that we can do all of this ourselves. Why should I handwrite it when I can write it on a word processor? Those jobs are never coming back. To the extent that, as Marlene suggested, what an, what an academic will do when faced with a problem is produce a paper, we're expected to cover a whole lot more of that process. I would really love to know, other than historical analogy, what gives you such faith? that AI will not displace, and you didn't mean our jobs, you meant jobs for all of humanity, because it's quite clear AI and other technological innovations are displacing loads of people's jobs. And some of them, and here I am again, maybe are too old to start a new career. Where do you get that faith? All I'm saying is new jobs will be created, that's all. And people will have to change what they're doing right now and move on to newer jobs, like data scientists, which is happening right now. So many job opportunities for data scientists, which is a new opportunity. So people will move on from what they're doing right now into newer yeah. technologies. I'll give you a different analogy. Yes. Once upon a time, 150 years ago, virtually everybody in the United States could play a musical instrument or sing a song. And people did. They entertained themselves, right? And loads and loads of people made a living as musicians if they were a little better than the people around them. Nowadays, we can get the very best performers, and we can reproduce their performances digitally at a fraction of the price, so that, in fact, what had been a flat pyramid has become a very, very narrow pyramid. And we have a very, very small number of people who make an enormous amount of money by charging much, much less per performance 
to this huge, huge group of people. And what that means is a whole lot of people are never going to become musicians. It is true there will be data scientists. And I predict, uh, if we can let the past be prologue, that the very best data scientists will put out of work all those other data scientists. The same way when I started looking at these things, 20, I started using computers in my teaching in 1975, right? When I started looking at these things, we would hire programmers. Now, for simple, basic programming, we have programs that will do the programming. Define the problem. So the, the pyramid's going like this. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't use that as an historical analogy rather than the situation around the Luddites. And that's why I'm asking you, since you are a computer scientist, what data do you have? I hear your faith, but I want to know your data. I have grandchildren. I want them to grow up to have the pleasure of doing useful work. I don't have, I mean, it's all historical analysis, so I don't have any, I, I, I don't have any data to prove what I'm saying in the future, like 10 years from now, what's going to happen. But just historically, what I've seen, yeah. <laughs> I wish I had. Well, Me too. Well, how do you have data about the future? The yeah. what? Okay, any other questions? Hi. Um, thank you so much. That was really fascinating. I just wanted to bring up this came up earlier today in just during the symposium. This idea of the weapons of mass distraction. I think we can we can also think about the fact that the monster is actually involved or engaged in reading. In fact, he reads other books to become <clears throat> to learn about who he is, to learn about finding truth, etc. So we might want to sort of think of that as the, the other important piece or one moment in the novel sort of as the antithesis of something we've all discussed and maybe whether to sort of think on a solution or as a, from a solution-oriented place, how reading, since we know reading literature especially, can actually increase empathy. So whether the book, and many people of course are exploring these questions, how can we involve reading to sort of combat quote unquote the, this our, our our very short attention span. Mm -hmm. so, any yeah. comments? Yeah, it's fine. I guess for myself, I went through a different antidote, and I think for my reading for sure. But when I I went, lived off the grid for a year actually while I was writing my dissertation because I didn't have the capacity for sustained thought, um, and I actually did almost like a phenomenological assessment of my own mental processes as I was living off the grid because I was arguing, you know, that these particular technologies were affecting many people's brains, so how are they affecting mine? And I think reading for sure, my capacity for reading increased, but the other thing I did is I actually started moving back into my body and I mean, I was a dancer when I was young and now I'm making dance pieces and what I discovered actually is, you know, mindfulness, yoga, movement, kinesthetic engagement, also um, alters those very same regions of the brain in the, the opposite direction in terms of increasing gray matter. Um, and so, and the other thing is, is, is about bringing people together in physical spaces, you know, to engage with one another because our brains, you know, our mirror neurons are actually more activated when they are engaging with computers than they are through looking at one another. And so what's happening is we have an increase of social emotional incompetence and in our, our ability to actually read social cues. So, you know, in addition to reading, I would, you know, advise people to get together into physical spaces and to move their bodies, um, you know, get away from the screen. Yeah. Thank you. Let's thank all four of our panelists for doing such a wonderful job.